Time is relentless. It just keeps going on and on and on, and it keeps moving. We like to say that time flies. We like to say that time goes by really quickly. But what we have to understand is that's not really true. That's just kind of how we picture it. Because the speed of time never changes. What was 24 hours yesterday was 24 hours a thousand years ago. It's 24 hours today. But the thing about time is it never stops. It keeps going and going and going. And so we need to remember that, that we need to make sure we take advantage of our time. That, I was thinking this week, I had a chance to go to the uh, William & Mary and NC State game on Thursday night, and I graduated from college 30 years ago this year. It makes me feel old. But I got to thinking about it. 30 years from now, so you look back to when you graduate from college, and I've got a daughter that graduated last year, and you think of the life that she has ahead of her and all the things she wants to do in her career and, and that type thing, and then you look. I'm 30 years in. 30 years from now, I'll be 82. I'll almost be Billy's age. <laughs> That's not true. He's actually a little bit younger than that, just so he won't fuss at me after the service. But, but, but the, my point is, it just keeps going away. And even in ministry... I started seminary um, when I was 35 years old. That's been 17 years. 17 years from now would put me at almost 70. What am I doing with the time that I've had? I can't change any of the time in the past. I went to a movie earlier this year finding Dory uh, while Barbara and I were at the beach. It was raining one day and we went to the mall and decided to go see the movie and before that movie, they showed this little three-minute clip. I don't know why they show them. It was absolutely useless. It was one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. And I looked at Barbara when it was over, and I said, that's three minutes of my life I am never getting back. But I wonder how many times at night we could look back at the day we just spent and say, there's 30 minutes there that I should have used differently, and I'm never going to get that chance again. See, here's the thing about time. When we look at it as a commodity, we never get to do it again. We can change moving forward. But we can never take back the time that we waste away. It's gone. It is three minutes or five minutes or an hour or a day of our life. We will never get back. And I want us to think about that as we begin to look at a parable today. We're finishing up our series of parables in Luke. We haven't covered all of them. We've covered most of them. And today we're going to look at the parable of the ten minus. Now in Luke chapter 19, if you want to, you turn your Bibles there. And, and as we get to Luke chapter 19, the beginning of that chapter is the story of Zacchaeus. Many of us are familiar with the story of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. We talked last week about how much uh, Jewish society hate the tax collectors, and he was actually over tax collectors. And so he was a very wealthy man, but he came to see Jesus, and Jesus went to his house and ate with him. And he promised Jesus, he goes, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor, and I'm going to pay back anybody that I've wronged four times greater than what I took from them. He was going to make restitution. There was a changed life. He was different after being in the presence of Jesus. But we're also at the point in Christ's life, and we'll see this referred to in the first verse, that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Now, the best we understand, based primarily on the Gospel of John, we believe that Jesus' ministry lasted about three years, uh, going by the number of times that he went into Jerusalem to the Passover. In this particular time, so Jesus has had some years, and we're about, if after this passage, we would go into the triumphant entry. And so Jesus is now known the miracles that he's done, people have been to recognize maybe this is the Son of God, and they're going to wave palm branches to him. Hell is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is he. And, and they're going to praise Jesus, and they're going to think this is the Messiah coming in. Our God that's going to deliver us from the Romans is right here. Our God that's going to deliver us from the Romans is finally going to do it. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, Jesus has used that expression a lot. But his meaning of the kingdom of God at hand is much more about the idea that salvation has changed in following him and he has come to usher in how it is that people are going to respond to God. And so we get to this parable in Luke chapter 19. Do me a favor. I don't know if it's the monitor or what, but something is echoing up here and killing me. 
Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Therefore, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be a king and then return. He called ten of his slaves, gave them ten minas, and then told them, engage in business until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. At his return, having received the authority to be king, he summoned those slaves he had given the money to so he could find out how much they had made in business. First came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. Well done, good slave, he told him, because you have been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over ten towns. Second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said to him, You will be over five towns. Another came and said to him, Master, here is your mina. I've kept it hidden away in a cloth because I was afraid of you. For you are a tough man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you don't sow. He told him, I will judge you by what you have said, you evil slave. If you knew I was a tough man collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why didn't you at least put my money in the bank? And When I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. They said to him, Master, he has ten minas. I told you, but to everyone who has, more will be given. And from me, from the one who does not have, even what he does not have will be taken away. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. Let you unite our hearts in prayer. Dear Lord, as we come before you, we again come praising you as God. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can, this morning, reflect on the very words of Jesus. That your spirit, spirit moved in Luke to record those. And that we have the opportunity to learn directly from what Jesus said. Lord, I pray that you'll take these words through the power of your Holy Spirit and change us, convict us, and draw us closer to you. Lord, not from anything that I say, but from the words that you have provided. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The theme of our passage is that we are accountable for all that God provides us. We are accountable for all that God provides provides us. One of the things that I've loved about Luke as we've gone through and looked at his parables in detail, and it's been kind of interesting even to just go from parable to parable and not look at all the different stories in between. It's interesting how often Luke tells us who the parable is targeted at. Here's the target audience. Here is who needs to pay close attention to this parable and who can learn from it. So they're listening to this. They're listening to the story of Zacchaeus and hearing everything that Jesus said that he has come uh, not to seek, and to, but to, he has come to seek and to save the lost. And as they're listening to that, he goes on to tell a parable um, because he was near Jerusalem. And again, as he's going near Jerusalem, people are thinking, this is the time. God is going to deliver us. He's going to give us the Messiah that's going to deliver us. And they're looking to be delivered from the Romans. And he told them a parable. Those that were near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Now, again, Jesus used the expression, the kingdom of God is at hand, but he meant that because he, the Messiah, has arrived. He, the Messiah, was going to die, be resurrected, return to heaven, and, and so the kingdom of God was, was now. But it wasn't going to be the physical kingdom that they expected. It wasn't going to be the, 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 the victory over the Romans. It was the eternal kingdom that he was bringing. And so he wanted to make sure that they understood even what the kingdom of God was about. And that there was a period of time before it would come. So he says to them, a noble traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king. And then return. All right, so this nobleman is going to go to a faraway country. As he is at that faraway country, he's going to receive authority while he's there, and then he's going to come back and reign. 
Now, that seems kind of crazy to us, right? Because it seems like if you were the king, you would already be in this area, and the person that was going to rule over this area would be made king in this area. But it's interesting that, that Jesus, as he's telling this parable, they would be associating it with Herod. Because that's how Herod became ruler over Judea. He, Herod, departed for Roman, for Rome. He had authority given to him to tell him he would be the king over Judea. And then as he came back from Rome, now he has the authority as the leader over that area. And so they've seen a picture of this where someone has to go to Rome and then come back and give an authority. But for those believers, for the listeners that he's got, the, the way that they could have interpreted that was that Jesus is getting ready to go away. He's told his disciples numerous times he's going to die, he's going to go away. Jesus is going to come back on the third day, and he is now going to have the authority that God has given him. That's why Jesus says, remember how the Great Commission begins? We always start with go therefore, we forget what the therefore is there for. And it says, all authority has been given to me, therefore, go and make disciples. All authority has been given to me. So Jesus has authority. So Jesus has that authority and then says the disciples to go. But the better picture for us to understand this with is that after Jesus spent about 40 days with the disciples, he then goes back to heaven. And he is being crowned as king. He is worshipped as king. And one day he is going to return. And we need to understand that when Christ comes, that's when the kingdom of God is going to officially be ushered in. God has authority now. God has rule now. God has power now. But his kingdom will officially be ushered in when Jesus Christ, who has left and been ascended to heaven, will then return. And so, we are the target audience for this parable. Now, what do we learn? It says, he called ten of his slaves together and gave them ten minas. Told them, engage in business until I come back. So there's ten slaves, and we know by how they respond later in this parable that each slave is given one mina. Now, I want us to remember as we go through this parable, a lot of people consider this to be the same as the parable of the talents that we read about in Matthew and Mark. But there's some distinct differences. When we look at the parable in Matthew and Mark, when we look at the parable of the talents, there's only three people that are, giving, uh, that are given talents. We also read in those, that parable that one is given ten talents, one's five, and one's given one. They're given different talents, different amounts of talents. The other thing we want to understand, and it plays a part as we continue to interpret this passage later on, is that a mina, now talent is money. We think of talent as in abilities, but, but a talent was, a, was money. And a mina is uh, much less money than a talent. Some people say one sixteenth, one some say one sixtieth, but the point is a mina is not a whole lot of money. Now, it's believed that the ten minas would have been worth about uh, thirty days worth of wages for the average, per or ninety days worth of wages, about three months worth of pay for the average person. So it's not any nothing, but it's still not a large amount to be divided ten ways in order to say, go and do business. So we want to understand that this is different than the parable of the talents, but we also want to understand that a mina is not a huge piece of money. It's something small. And so he says, take this little bit that I'm going to give you, and I'm going to go away, and I want you to do business with it. But his subjects, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. Now, I'll be honest, I, I, the first couple of times I read this passage, I had really, we'll see there's two different judgments as we go through here, and we'll talk about that. But, but there's also two different groups of people. And we want to make sure that we keep those two groups of people separated in our minds as we go through this story. There's the servants or the slaves that have each been given a mina and tasked with do business while I'm gone. Now, these are the subjects. These are the ones that he's going to come back. He's ruling over more than these ten. He's ruling over this area, and the people that he's going to rule over, they're saying, we don't want him. Let's send someone to where this nobleman's going and say, we don't want to be under his authority. We don't want him to rule over us. We want to reject his authority. That's the subjects. All right, so there's the slaves, the noblemen, the slaves, and the subjects. And we'll get back to them really at the very end of the parable. Now, 
the nobleman's return. He's returned. He's received the authority to be king. He summoned those slaves he had been given the money to so he could find out how much they had made in business. What have you done with the mina that I have given you? What have you done? I have left you with resources. I have left you with something to go about and do business. Essentially, we could say, do my business. What are you going to have done with it? First one came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned 10 more minas. Now, here's the other thing we're going to learn as we go through. We're not going to get a report from all 10. I think in some ways that's why it gets kind of mixed up with the, the parable of the talents because there's three of them and we only get three reports back. But the first guy comes back and he says, okay, I've got 10 minas now. And the master said, the nobleman says, okay, that's great. In fact, I'm going to give you 10 cities um, to rule over. You have been faithful in a very small manner, now have authority over 10 towns. So because you've been faithful with just a little bit of money, I'm going to put you in charge of 10 cities. And that, well done, good slave, he told him. Because you've been faithful with 10. The second one came up and said, Master, your mina has made five manas, minas. So the next one comes and goes, well, I've made five. He said to him, you will be over five towns. Now, we need to understand, what does that mean for us? So they come back, they give the report to the nobleman, and they say, uh, I brought you back ten minas. And he says, okay, you take, you've been faithful in the small little bit of money. I'm going to put you over ten towns. Now, Jesus is talking about when he returns the second time. When Jesus comes back again, he is going to judge what we have done with something small. What are we doing with the little things that we have on earth? What are we doing with the things that God has given us? When we stand before Christ when he returns, when we stand before God as our judge, what have we done with what God has given us? What are we going to do with our times, with our talents, and all that we have? What are we going to do with that? We want Jesus, we want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Are we willing to go and to do the business now? Are we willing to go and be about the master's work? If you're faithful in something small, God's going to give us more. Now, I want to point out that if we take this literally, we will reign. Well, if I've read Scripture right, it tells us that we will reign, R-E-I-G-N, with Christ forever. That means that we are going to rule with Christ forever. You ever thought about that? We reign with Christ. We are leaders with Christ. We are not all going to gather in the sanctuary and sing Kumbaya 24 hours a day. Or there is work to be done in heaven. Now, I don't know what that work is. I don't know exactly what we're going to do. I do know this, part of what we will rule, part of what we will reign, part of what we will be over is angels. I just want to remind us again, we do not turn into angels. In fact, I don't want to be an angel. Because when we get to heaven, we'll be over the angels. Clarence doesn't get wings. We are created in the image of God. And we will rule with Christ forever. We will reign. Now, how much we rule over and how much we reign is directly proportional to how responsible we are with what God gives us here. See, I think that's why he gives us three reports. He wants to give us a picture. We don't need to know about all ten. There's three characters that we're going to learn about. One got ten, he did great, he's rewarded with ten cities. One did five, he got rewarded with five cities. It's proportional. If you do what God does, whatever we do with what God gives us, that will be our reward in heaven. But it could be that we just want to get in heaven. And we want to sneak in. And that's really kind of what we see with this last guy. You can go with me to verse 20. And another came and said to him, Master, here is your mina. I kept it hidden away in a cloth because I was afraid of you. 
For you're a tough man. You collect what you didn't deposit, and you reap what you didn't sow. So he told him, all right, I'm going to judge you by what you've said, you evil slave. If you knew I was a tough man, collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why didn't you at least put the money in the bank and at least get interest? So he took the one that he had and said, give it to the one with ten. The people are flabbergasted. Well, he's already got ten. Why does he get more? And Jesus says, haven't I told you that those that have much will be given more? The more we do for God, the more we will receive. But look at the one slave. He just wants to hang on. All I want to do is just hang on to this one mina. I'm going to put it in a cloth. I'm just going to hang on to it, and I'm going to cling to that. And I think sometimes we're satisfied with saying, I know I'm going to go to heaven. See, it's interesting. This guy's a slave, and they take away the mina. They take away what he was going to potentially rule in heaven. It was given to someone else. But it never says he's going to not be a slave and in God's presence forever. That, that will see you in the next group. But he is just clinging hold, hanging on to what he's got. I just want to get in heaven. I just don't want to be punished. I'm not worried about the grace of God and what he's going to give me. I just don't want to be punished. And he just holds on to it, puts it in a cloth, and hangs on one. He goes, you're a tough master and a hard judge. And, and I want us to remember, God is a tough judge. He's a high standard. God doesn't grade on a curve. I don't get to be judged based on what you do. I don't get to be judged on what my neighbor does. I get judged on what I do with the mina that God gave me. What did I go out and do for his business, for God and his glory? I just want to, I just want to get in. I've shared with y'all before, there's a, a youth guy that, where I used to pastor, and he told me one time, he goes, man, he goes, I just want to get in. I, 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 I'll be happy if I am the last person that gets into heaven as long as I make the cut. And we might have that attitude, I just want to get in. But this is my concern, has been my concern for that guy for over a decade since he told me. And his life plays out like someone who's more focused on this world because that's the problem with that attitude is that it looks at this world. Deep down in my heart, I want this world. Yeah, I want to get into heaven. I, want to, I, basically, I don't even really want to get into heaven as much as I just want to avoid hell. But this world's what I really want to pursue. And I want to pursue every bit of this world that I can pursue and then get into heaven. And I just want to tell you, as long as we're focused on what's in it for us, as long as we're focused on my glory and what I'm going to receive and what I'm going to do, then I have not surrendered to the authority of God. As long as it's about me. My salvation experience cannot be, I want to go to heaven and not hell, so therefore I'm going to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. No, that's the benefit of the change of salvation. That's the benefit of being a believer. But salvation only comes about when we recognize the holiness of God and want to confess our sin, are in awe of who he is and want to seek forgiveness. It comes about only when we believe that Christ took on our sins and died on the cross and rose again to show victory over death and by wanting to surrender our life. And until we surrender our life, we're not truly a believer. See, that gets us to the last group. They're the ones, the, the subjects, not the slaves. The subjects that sent a delegation and said, I don't want to be under his authority. I don't want to be under his rule. And when we're on this earth, sometimes those people are easy to see. They live a lifestyle that makes it very easy to see that they have no desire to live under God. There are people that claim there is no God, and they have no desire to live under God. Sometimes that's really easy to see. Other times it's more subtle. 
We were reading, and we've been going through 2 Corinthians on Wednesday night, and it's, it's really easy to see near the end of 2 Corinthians, as, as Paul's talking about ministry, how many attacks on his ministry come from within the body of Christ. Because make no mistake, there are people on our rolls, and there are members of this church, as there are members of any church, that are relying on baptism and church membership to get them into heaven and have not genuinely surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. Those are the subjects because they reject the complete authority. Who makes the decisions in my life? Do I make them based on what I want? Or do I make them under the commands of God? See, that's the subjects. We get to verse 27. He finishes with the slaves. Those are part of the subjects to him. Bring here these enemies of mine. Bring the subjects. Bring those that sent the delegation and don't want to answer to my authority. Who do not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. God is a God of love. God loved the world in such a way that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God is a God of mercy. Jesus Christ bore our sins on the cross so that we don't have to pay the price. God gives us grace. He gives us more than we deserve and allows us to rule with him and allows us to have life in this earth. But make no mistake, God is a God of justice. And if God's standard for salvation is complete surrender to him, anything less than that will be judged. Bring them to me, and they will be slaughtered. There are two judgments. In this parable, there are two judgments that we read about consistently in Scripture. The separation of the sheep and the goats, the saved and the unsaved, the judgment of the saved, which we talked about with the minas, but there is a judgment for the goats. They're going to be in hell for eternity. Separated with God, from God, with no hope of being in His presence. There will be complete darkness. Scripture refers to the darkness of hell more than it refers to the fire in hell. Again, Alaska has the highest suicide rate in our country. Why? Because it's dark. And long nights. And dark is just depressing. Why do we like the spring? Because the light days get longer and the light grows. Darkness represents death. And those in hell spend eternity in darkness. They spend eternity being burned by flames, not flames that let you see, but by flames that are dark. And they will be in great agony. Remember the parable we had a couple weeks ago, the rich man and Lazarus, oh God, send Lazarus down that he would just tip the, dip the tip of his wa- finger in water that I could have some relief. There's a great chasm between us and he can't come over there and you can't come over here. There's a great chasm in hell that we can't cross over. We talk about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah where hell, fire, and brimstone rains down on the people and kills them all. And consistently in Scripture, that's the picture of the justice of God raining down on those that do not believe in Him and have not subjected themselves to His authority. Bring them in front of me, and I will slaughter them. Not because I didn't love them, not because I didn't die for them, but because they would not recognize my authority and chose to rule for themselves. As we look at this parable, there's really just two lessons. One is what we've just been talking about, that we will be judged on whether God is our king. We will be judged on whether God is our king. Do I know for sure that I have surrendered every aspect of my life to Christ? Do I know for sure that I have given him absolutely everything. Not the part, but the whole. I say Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. We say that in church all the time. Do I mean that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the master of my life? 
without subjecting all of my life to Christ, there is not genuine salvation. The second one is, will we, be, we will be judged on what God gives us for ministry. We will be judged on what God gives us for ministry. God gives us talents. Some people have the ability to sing. That's not me. You don't want me to sing. It would empty the place out. But people have different talents. Some sing beautifully. Some people are really good with numbers. Some people think numbers are the bubonic plague and want to avoid them at all costs. Our house is divided 50-50. We got two that like numbers and two that fuss if you put numbers in a sentence. It's just how it, we, we had different talents. And some people are naturally, just, just you, you see them and you want to put your head on their shoulder and they're just great at comforting people. Some of us don't have that gift. Some of us just, you know, my, my, I, I have to fight through this. My, my tendency when most people tell me they're having a problem and they tell me how they got in trouble is to go, don't you realize, stupid, what you did was going to create that? Why didn't you know? And I have to fight through not doing that because that's not my natural gift is to be comforting. I try, not that I don't care, but it's not natural. Some people are naturally more comforting. God gives us different talents. What am I doing with the talents that God gave me? What am I using for His glory? God doesn't just give us talents at our physical birth. God gives us spiritual gifts. Grace, mercy, teaching, preaching, they're, they're the generosity. There they're, they're are multiple lists in the Bible. We won't go through all those lists this morning, but make no mistake that God gave you, at the moment of your salvation, a spiritual gift. Now, I want you to think, what is your spiritual gift? And if you can't answer that question, how are you using that spiritual gift for God's glory? Much as a talent gets wasted if you don't use it, our spiritual gifts get wasted if we don't use them and we lose the ability to do it. What is your spiritual gift? And what are you doing it, using it for to build God's kingdom, to go about the business of God? God gives me talents at physical birth. He gives me spiritual gifts at my spiritual birth. But there's something else that God has given me. And we've already referred to it as we've talked about this passage. And that God gives me the very presence of himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Do I think about that? When I hear the expression, my body is a temple, do I realize, one, that only believers' bodies are temples? Because within my very essence of who I am, resides the Holy Spirit of God. Do I do things to build that presence in my life? Or do I squelch the Spirit of God with my rebellion and my selfishness and my lack of responding to what He's calling me to do? God's very presence is promised to me to be responsible with just the small things in this world to be so that I can receive the glory in the next. Now, I'll be honest. I have about decided that this may be my favorite weekend of the year because I'm not a baseball guy, and hallelujah, football is back. I love football. Now, I know for some people that doesn't do anything for you, but I love football. And I can't stand baseball, and I'm so glad football season has started. But this is what I've learned as I've watched football this weekend. It's kind of interesting to watch how teams are ranked and how good they're supposed to be. There's some teams that are ranked really high, and they come out and they lose, or they almost lose because they're like, yeah, we're good. And they don't put the work in. And then there's the other teams that aren't highly as touted, and they go, we're going to do everything we can to beat the famous people. 
and they work hard. And I really believe a lot of us are so focused in God giving me rewards in heaven and the crown I'm going to have and the glory I'm going to receive that we don't want to put the work in in this world. And we don't want to take the time that we have to serve God. We all have a different amount of time left. Different amount for all of us question is what am I going to do with that time? Because time is never going to stop. Second by second, minute by minute, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. And then it's over. And then I'm going to be in the presence of God and I'm going to have to give an account of what I've done with the mina that he has given me. Am I using my time, my talents, my spiritual gifts in the presence of God to do the business of God here on earth. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we again just come before you to praise you as God, to praise you because you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We thank you for this parable. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins and that you give us the Holy Spirit when we receive you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray in this moment that your spirit will challenge us with the truth of this passage. And that if we don't genuinely know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that in this moment we will surrender to him completely. Lord, just give that person courage to come up and speak with me as we sing in just a moment or come to the altar and pray. Lord, we also pray for those that know you, the slaves that we will live in a reverential awe and fear of who you are. That we'll be obedient and that we will serve you. Lord, I pray that indeed in this moment that we will rekindle and renew our surrender to your Lordship. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.